and welcome everyone once again to another installment of Metaphysical Communion number 13, Dangerous Men in Black. So for tonight's discussion, we are going to be talking about a very fascinating, unique, and strange occurrence in the annals of unidentified flying objects. This aspect is of the men in black. Many of you may have seen documentaries and cable shows about the men in black relating to the UFO phenomenon for many, many decades. I first learned about this well, many years ago, actually. I can't remember exactly when. And I always found it to be very unusual, which it is, but it's somehow, I got a feeling about it, a sense of something being really, really there in relating to this particular area of things. I, I always work as a spiritual intuitive with everything. When I see or hear things of this nature, I can tell right away when there is something to it, there's something real about it, or it's just false, you know, completely. When I first heard about this, it did pique my interest and it did cause my senses, you know, to go up, or as they say, when your antenna goes up. When I get that feeling, that sense that usually indicates that there is something real, you know, to this particular experience. And I just thought it was like, hmm, there's something real you know, to this. As I always thought there was something real to unidentified flying objects, flying saucers, UFO, as they're called. And this area made sense to me because this is also very closely aligned to the government and government cover-up. And again, all of those things, you know, rang a bell for me right away. It makes perfect sense in its own way. If you can say that this type of thing makes sense. And I said, of course, the government would know about these things. We're going all the way back to, of course, to Roswell back in 1947. For those of you who have been seeing my program for quite some time, uh, you know that I did a whole program back in the summer you know, on the Roswell incident and UFOlogy. And of course, we covered a lot regarding your know, government cover up, etc. So it would make sense that there would be people that they would have in place that would investigate these things whenever they would appear or show up, especially if there was something involved, a crash, or where people, you know, too many people would be seeing this, or a small group of people would ever be seeing something about this, and they immediately seem to know. In the many stories that I have read and seen about these things, there's a UFO incident, a UFO sighting, and then shortly thereafter, the government appears, sometimes in a matter of minutes. They are right there you know, at the site. Uh, sometimes it may take a little longer than that, depending. Things have changed throughout the decades with this, obviously. This wasn't the most well-known phenomenon back in the 1930s and 40s these here in this country, and it started to flourish, again, back in the 1940s, mainly because of the Roswell incident, but a few other things that happened along the way, usually in the southwestern portion of the United States of America, but also in other areas too, even back then, you know, also, usually more like in the Midwestern regions, Ohio, Illinois, uh, Wisconsin, those areas seem to always be prevalent with this type of activity. So between there, especially at that time, and the Southwest, and we're talking about once again, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Nevada, there in particular, so much wide open space, smaller population compared to other cities throughout the United States, especially in the Northeast and the West Coast. You have thousands and thousands of acres of land there that nobody lives in. It belongs to farmers, organizations, lots of open space, no big buildings or you know, tall things to obstruct the vision. Privacy is everywhere, darkness, especially back in that time, the light source electricity wasn't as prevalent as it is now. So it would make sense that 
extraterrestrial phenomenon, extraterrestrial beings would reside, for lack of a better way of saying it, or would travel throughout those regions of this country so they could do their research, their experiments, whatever that they were sent here to do, uh, or they came here to do, it would offer them a nice cover because who would go out there to find them? To expense, nobody around. Perfect places for them to hide, whether it's under the ground, in the mountains of Utah or Arizona, especially. New Mexico is a bit more flatter in territory, um, but still that region of the world, the climate, the clarity of the sky, um, again, the privacy that it offered if they wanted to observe you know, humans, if they wanted to have close encounters even with humans, they could get away with it a great deal because people were more naive at that time and they were more innocent. And if they talked to whatever, who would believe them, especially going back into the early 20th century. So it was just, just the right mix of things for these beings to, you know, to use these areas, especially in the Southwestern region, you know, to do their work. Um, the men in black phenomenon just ties in so beautifully with this in a way, even though it has its own mysteries, because if they are truly part of the government, uh, they could do this all in stealth. They could associate themselves very easily with the FBI, the CIA, especially the FBI, which they did mainly at that time. Uh, again, they would capitalize on the innocence and ignorance of people relating to these things at that time. So they would very, very easily be able to come and visit people who claim to have seen extraterrestrial craft or who had some sort of you know, um, encounter with alien life in some way. And they would come over and they'd investigate, but they'd also intimidate a lot of these people into silence. Their appearance, which can be quite impressive and sometimes even frightening, will only further cause terror you know, to people to, and to ask them to keep their mouth shut. And for the most part, many people did. We also have, of course, our regular government officials, those in the military and the armed force bases. And of course, we know, especially in the Southwest and Middle America, that there are these huge Air Force bases throughout. And it was easy for them to travel to these areas or so. And also they could just intimidate people without the need of this extra men in black you know, disguise. And they were successful and intimidating a lot of people and frightening a lot of people into silence for practically their entire lives. The men in black phenomenon is a little bit more sophisticated, more stylized you know, than the regular military in their uniforms and well-known people, of course, that would come out, you could trace them as well. With the men in black, you could not. They were too mysterious, very secretive. You wouldn't know even begin how to trace these types of people. And if you even approach the government with them, they would just simply say, we have no idea what you're talking about. So to have this type of group of people seem to be quite realistic in it to be included in this type of experience. But then it gets a little bit more bizarre than even that you know, as well. Anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share screen for a moment because I have prepared a bit of a PowerPoint presentation relating to this for our discussion here. So just go here for a moment. Just a few pictures more than anything else, just to give some visuals you know, to this experience. So as you see here, we are discussing the men in black, and for the most part, they certainly have been known as being dangerous because of their intimidation factor, but also because of other things that several other witnesses or people who encountered them have seen uh, to the point where they've been frightened out, nearly out of their wits. So we have a supernatural component, a paranormal component related you know to these individuals you know also not with every single encounter but with a wide variety of them 
they're described in different ways also. What I'm going to show you tonight as we go through our discussion here is photographs that are claimed to be actual you know, pictures or videos of real men in black. For as far as I know, these are not fake for the most part, or certainly, you know, artist drawings either. These have been claimed through videotape, et cetera, throughout the decades to be actual men in black. These uh, photographs I'm gonna show you are not the easiest to come by, number one. It doesn't happen with every single encounter, obviously. These happen fortuitously because of where these people seem to go to to visit several witnesses or so shortly after a UFO encounter. And from time to time, they've been able to be filmed, photographed in some way. So these are quite rare. Are they real or not? That's part of the mystery of all of this. We can't really claim that they are. There's really not much evidence to back up that indeed these photographs of these people are real or not. We just have to go by word of mouth from individuals, but there's particular settings here that give it more credence, however. So uh, moving along, first of all, here's one of those very photographs. This was taken back as a video actually at a hotel in Niagara Falls in 2012. So this is a more recent encounter. Now, apparently a person who works in this hotel had reported some sort of UFO activity that they had witnessed. So sure enough, shortly after, I think perhaps a day or so after, uh, the men in black somehow, they're magically are able to trace people. Number one, even if you call to report these things that you don't really say who you are, what you are, how you are, they manage somehow to know and to find you. So that's mystery number one. So here we have a video that was taken at the entrance of the hotel of two mysterious men in black, you know, coming in to interview you know, a, one of these witnesses, you know, there. And this was back, I do believe, in October 24th of 2012, from what I read about mainly, and Niagara Falls. And they went and they certainly, you know, found the individual. I do believe he was working at this hotel. And, you know, they did interview the person. And of course, as usual, they pressured him into silence or intimidated the person into silence. Now, looking at this photograph in particular, the men in black here are showing, you know, their distinctive style and attire. So they always come dressed, you know, in black clothing, black suits, black tie, white shirt, uh, black coats. They seem to be timeless in their clothing choices. This goes back, you know, all the way back to the 1940s when they pretty much dress the same way even to this date. So their style hasn't really evolved in all these decades. They wear, of course, that particular type of hat always. A lot of them have dark glasses usually. The brim of the hat usually tends to um, hide a lot of their facial features for the most part. So sometimes it's a bit difficult to see them unless they're really, really close up. They usually tend to be very pale in color. Uh, a lot of them seem not to have hair. They seem bald. They have a stern look on their face for the most part. Some of them have been known to have this strange and bizarre smile and sometimes in some encounters, they seem to smile the whole time that they are with witnesses or speaking to them. They tend to meet people in public places, like places of work. They have gone to places, uh, to people's homes. You know, also, they've interviewed all kinds of people, all ages, um, all economic backgrounds, all cultures, um, children even. And they, you know, just always come, usually they come in either two or three. Very rarely have I heard that it's just one that makes an appearance. They also tend to drive uh, black cars, black sedans you know, also. And some have also been reported to come like in black, like helicopters. Everything is always in black you know, with them. They tell people that they are associated, at least a lot of them, that they are associated with the US government. 
and some have said that they are in conjunction with the FBI. Some just say that the secret branch you know, of the government. And they all resemble pretty much one another whenever these encounters do occur, which causes people, you know, to be intimidated and to be even frightened a lot of times. Their demeanor is kind of cool, um, no sense of humor, really, uh, detached. Um, of course, that means that they're very serious and professional in their way. They speak perfect English or whatever language they speak, because I'm sure this phenomenon happens in other countries as well. I'm only focusing on the United States because that's where the bulk of the information comes from. And this is where they have also you know, been reported, you know, mainly from here. So their English is perfect. They don't really call themselves by names or so. They may have badges to identify themselves. But they come in and they at times may meet people, I say, in public. They even have gone to diners or so to discuss the situation with people. They tend to tell people about the experience itself, what this craft is like, what this happens, how it is. So witnesses are taken aback by the amount of knowledge that a lot of these people have relating to these things. So they seem to know about the experience before the person gets a chance to even tell them more about their own particular encounter and experience. So that can be rather off-putting as well. So they like to show off their knowledge, their experience you know, with this phenomenon. And then they go into their intimidating factors, their fear factors, you know, and they have threatened people's lives, they threatened people's families. Uh, a lot of people have been very, very affected badly by this. It's, uh, many cases, especially more in the past, people have been affected for the rest of their lives. I mean, they've been traumatized by these experiences and they don't dare speak about it for many, many years. That especially was more back in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. Now, you know, newer age here, people are not so frightened anymore because more of this is in the media, more of this is spoken about. You see shows about this, you know, constantly on television documentaries constantly all the time. The movies also portray them. We have the popular Men in Black films. And that really brought this phenomenon more into public domain. So more people are aware of this more than ever before. Of course, those films are Hollywood and it's just, you know, stories and just for, you know, it's lots of CGI, special effects, you know, to entertain. But there's a lot of stuff there that actually comes from reality, from true experience. And it's just been written into the scripts and whatever and made just commodity, you know, for the public you know, to consume. But nevertheless, it has made people more aware of this. And then we have, of course, cable television, especially that has shown programs on the men in black phenomenon. So people have become more desensitized. They've become more knowledgeable. They're not so frightened of these things unless they have a particular encounter where they do engage with these beings for real. They come to them, to their town, to their neighborhood, whatever. And then from there is where the fright can begin, even to this day. I mean, I would be frightened too. Actually, if you know, if I had an encounter, I reported or so, or even if I kept it shut, and then these government officials looking all strange and pasty white, dressed in black with black hats would come to my door or to my place of work and want to see me and want to interview me. And knowing who they are, in my case, in particular, I'd be a bit taken aback, but at the same time, I'd be very wary because, and not so, let's say, traumatized, because I know what this is about. I know who they are. And that makes a difference. That does make a difference. The more unafraid that you are, the more unafraid that you show yourself to be of them, that seems to somehow remove their fear factor you know, from them. They seem to almost back off. I'll explain a little bit more later on about a kind of a personal encounter I had in some way with this type of experience. So that will make more sense to you as I tell that story. But um, we've known about the Men in Black for decades or so. They first came into being somewhat back in 1947. 1947 seemed to be the year where 
extraterrestrial phenomenon, UFOs really seem to come out you know, into the world. Just a few months around that same period or so, we had the Roswell incident, you know, also happened in New Mexico in July, June, July, 1947. And that was reported obviously in New Mexico newspaper and that's when that all blew up you know, from there. And then we know a lot about that story, you know, about how the government immediately came the next day or so and kind of started to squash that, that story quickly you know, from there. But nevertheless, that's what ignited the entire UFO you know, frenzy, extravaganza or so. And it's carried on ever since. And then more experiences were known and seen to happen and whatever. It kept on going from there. And along the way, from time to time, we also had the men in black appear. And when people became braver in time, they started speaking up about this thing. So going back to 1947, we can report about an incident, a UFO incident uh, in Maury Island. And I have some documentation here so I can provide a little accurate information for you. You can know about it. And let me just bring that forth. This was Maury Island, and it was at the Puget Sound. And it was all started with a gentleman, a boat, his son, and their dog, that they were out you know, in Puget Sound, you know, sailing one day. And it just, for some reason, they, the gentleman looked up into the sky and noticed there were these six donut-shaped craft hovering above them over Puget Sound in that area. And then apparently something happened with one or two of the craft and one seemed to explode and perhaps the other one as well and a grain of debris, of metallic debris, it started falling from the sky and upon them. So the gentleman, of course, was injured, and the son was hit in the arm with this debris. Uh, the dog, unfortunately, they had with them on the boat did not survive the experience because it was quite a lot of debris, and obviously a lot of it was quite heavy, you know, also, and it fell right into Puget Sound. So, of course, they were traumatized, you know, by the experience. And let me say, this, I do believe this happened in June of 1947. And that's when all of this began to be known. Yes, it's actually the date of June 27th, 1947, when all of this started to happen from there. So let me look at this very quickly for you a bit. Yes, as I said, it was near Puget Sound. The gentleman's name was Harold Dahl. And he was on a conservation mission there. And he was out on his boat, as I said earlier. And this was near the shore of Washington's Maury Island. So this is the state of Washington. So he was just gathering some logs, sailing along with his son and their pet dog. And then all of a sudden, you know, this UFOs appeared. And then one apparently had a malfunction or crashed into another one. And it broke up into pieces and things fell from the sky. And of course, as I said, you know, his son was injured in the arm a bit and they sailed back because they were terrified and traumatized. The gentleman, luckily, Mr. Dahl was able to uh, capture some photographs, you know, on his camera at that time. I was trying to look for the pictures, I couldn't find them. So I'm gonna see if I can keep locating those particular pictures, if they are available over the internet and I'll post them on another time on my page. So, um, so he did do that, then he called you know, then he reported to his supervisor by the name of Fred Christman. And then Mr. Christman was very skeptical at first. Obviously, people would be, especially at that time period. But nevertheless, he and Mr. Dahl went back out to Puget Sound to the very area, you know, there. And Mr. Christman actually saw the craft and the materials, you know, there. So that's when this really became more concrete, because now we had an extra witness. So from there, that was reported from there. And then it seems the following day, Mr. Dahl was visited by a man in a black suit. So just like maybe 24 hours or less, immediately, someone came to town. And they ended up at a local diner uh, where the man was able to recount in extraordinary detail what Dahl had just experienced and said, what I have said 
is proof to you that I know a great deal more about this experience of yours than you will want to believe. Uh, the man said, according to an author who wrote the very, one of the first books on this phenomenon, uh, author's name is Gray Parker, who wrote the first book on the men in black in, in 1956 entitled, They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers. And that whole story about Mr. Dahl was incorporated into that book. So, Mr. Dahl was told not to speak of the incident. If he did bad things, it would happen. And that is the MO you know, of the men in black. They always say that, you know, bad things will happen if you open your mouth. And that became a running theme with the men in black for decades afterwards. So the book is right here for you to see. This is the original cover, by the way. If you're interested in finding out more, you can order it over the internet, usually through Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Abe Books. You'll be able to find it relatively easily. So again, it's called They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers. The author is Gray Barker. So it's one of the most seminal works you know, on this subject. In addition, there's also the next book, if you can see there, called Flying Saucers and the Three Men. So that was another experience that was famous in the annals of the Men in Black phenomenon. This was written by a author and also a Men in Black experiencer, as they're known, Albert K. Bender. At this time, of course, he collaborated with Gray Barker from the previous book. So Gray Barker was able to provide an introduction you know, to this book. This is also another well-known book on the subject of the men in black. So that's how that began from there. So the supposed events of Maury Island have continued to fuel conspiracy theories to this day, even though a US government investigation deemed it a hoax after Dahl and Grisman later admitted as much. But of course, this is typical behavior with witnesses, whether it's men in black or UFO or other phenomenon, the government can be very, very impressive on people and they can threaten your life and the life of your loved ones. And in many cases, who knows what has happened if many of them have, you know, gone through with those threats. So they will make people, you know, recant their stories. They will make them lie and say that it did not happen after all. It's happened countless times, whether it's with the men in black, the Roswell incident, other incidents that have happened relating to unidentified flying objects or other items of the paranormal or so, people then tend to start to confuse their stories. They start elaborating, making changes to their stories, you know, also as the years go by. So it makes it very difficult to know what is truth and what is false. It is another running theme of the paranormal. That's why it has always made it very difficult to really take this seriously by the general public, even to this date in 2021. Too much delusion in a way, too much confusion, too much doubt. Even though slowly in the past, let's say five years, it's starting to turn differently as the focus has come more into revealing more about these things as more people are opening up and talking about these experiences that is being presented more on television at an ever rapid pace as the government has finally opened the lid on the secret files and have brought it into public domain. We're starting to see and read about all these incredible secret societies or so, the Majestic 12, you know, um, Project Grill Frame, Project Blue Book, we're starting to see the actual materials or so they say, but there's always this area of, you really wonder if that's really, really true or not. And it could be actually part of this whole experience just to keep this again under wraps by keeping the public and everyone confused about this, making it convoluted, making it mysterious, making it very, very doubtful. It can be all part of this. And there are those who are now admitting 
as well, that this has all been part all along of this by the government and those in control of these things. That part of the reason why you have all these shows in part and hearing all these stories and the government releasing documentation or whatever could still be a continuation of that, of that confusing, of causing doubt still. Even though a lot more is starting to come out now and it's getting to the point where things are starting to turn, where it's becoming less doubtful, less fearful and more grounded. And then the reason why that is. So this could be that finally, gradually, we're being introduced into the reality of this subject, the concrete truth in a very comfortable way as not to cause fear, panic into the world when whether the government or whether the beings from the other worlds finally make themselves known. So we'll be, let's say, more prepared, more ready, hopefully, to accept this and not run in terror. Now, so as I said, so there was less confusion still about all of this. Now, very important point here. In all of their different incarnations, the men in black usually have one main purpose, to muzzle witnesses of strange paranormal phenomenon, which I've just been saying all along, just different terminology. They almost always wear black suits and hats with dark sunglasses, drive black cars and arrive in groups of two or three. Some describe them as one would an FBI agent while others recall the men in black as having a strange appearance, sometimes with supernatural uh, features like glowing eyes and strange complexions and other things as well, which we'll be talking about in a moment. So if you wanted to find out more about these things, you can look into these texts. Uh, they knew too much about flying saucers from Gray Barker or flying saucers and three men from Albert K. Bender. Also, another very good book on the subject is from Nick Redfern, uh, The Real Men in Black. So Nick is a more modern investigator of the uh, men in black and UFO phenomenon and other paranormal you know, things as well. You've perhaps, many of you perhaps have seen him many times on different uh, programs like Ancient Aliens and Paranormal Witness, etc. on cable television. He's a frequent contributor and he's wrote this wonderful book uh, called The Real Men in Black. So this is stories from the past, but also more contemporary and more up-to-date information is incorporated in this book. So, here we have Kenneth Arnold, and Kenneth Arnold was one of the first military people to have an encounter with UFOs, you know, also back in the 1940s, and perhaps with the men in black phenomenon as well. And I do believe he was a pilot or so. And well, all three gentlemen were pilots. And he was one who reported one of the first unidentified flying objects to the military. And from there, of course, he was naturally silenced and having him change his story or so. But nevertheless, the fascinating thing about this was that the pilots E.J. Smith and Ralph E. Stevens, uh, to your left and to your right, you know, uh, they all met and they spoke about this. And then when both gentlemen went home on their plane, a mysterious air crash occurred and they all perished right afterward. So that just adds to the mystique of this experience. Now, here we have another photograph. I do believe this is from Europe of what is reported as an actual you know, man in black who was videotaped at a store, I do believe. And I've seen a little bit of the video itself. So if you look into you know, that uh, website there, which I have underneath, you can you know, look for this yourself and you can see the actual video. This didn't happen that long ago either, but it is a, what I think, 10 minute video of this occurrence and the behaviors that exhibited. And he went to visit one person or one witness apparently. And he seemed to very much like the men in black movie have a device in his hand and basically, you know, shoot a light 
at the gentleman while he was interviewing him, which caused him to stop and to pause and to become very quiet. Afterward, uh, this being, you seemed to tell the person to get up or so and started to ask him to do things. And the other one mindlessly seemed to, Liam, he's called, seemed to mindlessly do everything that this person you asked him to do. So there's some strange occurrences in this video. Is this real? Is this not? I really cannot say. To me, frankly, when I just saw it, I thought this looks very orchestrated. This could be just some video that some people got together to shoot just to, you know, just for conspiracy, just to, to be creative or so, just to cause commotion or whatever. I can't really say that it's the most professional thing I've ever seen, but at the same time, it looks very interesting and unique, you know, also. And it has been claimed that this was an actual real life occurrence of a real uh, man in black. Again, look into the website, read up on it, look at the video, you can make up your own mind to see whether you feel this is a true story or not. For the most part, a lot of it is indicated that indeed this is an actual man in black and that story really did occur. And that these people do have strange abilities and powers. It's interesting that this gentleman has this strange little device with the flashlight because that we saw a lot in the Men in Black movies. That's how they were able to um, erase people's memories you know, with that device. So it was interesting that this was incorporated into that or that the movies incorporated that from perhaps from this video or from other stories that people have heard about. So again, it's up to you whether you believe or not, if this is real or not or so. Um, so from here, we have these interesting stories that are happening here with these things with this phenomenon or so. So again, it's always tied into UFO, or as it's now being called, an identified aerial phenomenon. This is the latest terminology, because apparently people feel, or those in the know, or whether the government, especially, who's now termed unidentified aerial phenomenon, UAP, that somehow this makes it less extraterrestrial. It makes it more that it could be from humans, and that this craft that people see from time to time could be actually something that's man-made right here on earth. So that term is supposed to demystify, you know, the subject somewhat. And I'm thinking, you know, I don't really think so. First of all, aerial and flying are pretty much the same thing. And phenomenon, as opposed to flying, or as opposed to object, excuse me, actually makes it seem even more strange and more bizarre because it's a phenomenon. It's not the usual. At least an object is an object. That you could very commonplace. You can use it in any kind of way. So phenomena already has that aura of mystery and the strange and the bizarre. So I don't know where they're coming from with that. So once again, this is just perhaps another way of adding a bit of confusion or fear you know, to people you know, as well. You never know with these things. Nevertheless, it's being discussed more and more. It's being presented more and more. More and more people are discussing and talking about it. And it's becoming more credible. And more and more people seem to be starting to believe in these things. And in believing further that there are, there is life in other worlds and that they've been coming here for decades, hundreds, thousands of years. And it's just desensitizing people, making people on this world more comfortable with the subject matter which is a good thing because God knows should the day come when they finally reveal themselves, at least we hopefully will not start running in terror, you know, and becoming, you know, all filled with, you know, with PST, uh, PTSD. So we'll find out as we go along. Anyway, moving along a bit, let me see, I want to add a little bit more information here about this. So let's see. Um, in addition to what I discussed, all right, so we have these people. There's Arthur K. Bender, who had experienced as well, back around that time period, so in the 50s or so. And he was visited one evening in his office by three of these mysterious men in black. However, unlike Mr. Dahl, where he had this man just come up to him, I guess driving in a car or so, and meeting at a diner, uh, Mr. Bender has a different take on his experience where these three beings just materialized before him. 
in his office and they were floating about a foot in the air and they seem to materialize through the wall. So now we're getting to more of the unusual and more paranormal aspect of the men in black phenomenon. So they came in mysteriously, they had flashing eyes and they were, you know, he caused them a great deal of fear and trauma. And sure enough, they told them, you know, to keep quiet about your experience. Don't say a word or else we'll cause you great harm. And he was traumatized. He was going to re reveal all this stuff and whatever, but he was so frightened that he kept it quiet, you know, for many, many years until he lost the fear and decided to speak about it. it. Took him a while to recover from all of that. And as you can see, he wrote several books actually you know, on the subject. So, but still it was quite an impressive experience. It caused a lot of mental damage to him as they have caused a lot of mental problems for a lot of people who have had these experiences. We're hearing more about them. And I showed we're gonna be hearing more as more people become brave and older and not so fearful anymore. And as time moves by, because they don't tend to revisit people very much. So as the decades pass or whatever, they lose fear of it. They hear more and more people talking about it and seeing it on television. And they too are starting to reveal about their stories more and more. So we have a lot more information to learn you know, about this subject. So we told, I told you about that as well. And again, you can look up for a lot of more of this information over the internet or so. And let me see, there's other researchers you can find out about. Just put, type in real men in black in your internet engine search. Don't go, just say men in black because immediately we'll go to the movies. And all you're gonna see is about the movies and, and Will Smith and, and the film and the, the strange little bug creatures and whatever. You don't wanna see that. You want to go into the real men in black phenomenon or a real men in black UFO experience. And that way you'll get more, the, more concrete and real information about the subject matter. So we have that there as well. All right, so now let me tell you a bit about my experience that I had that relates you know, to this you know, also. So before I do, let me just show you one last photograph that I have you know, on this for you to see. If you want to look more into these photos yourself, you certainly can, again, in the internet. So the photos I present here are, especially to uh, your left, is one of the more famous photos that have been taken from a security cameras also years ago. And this is a good close up that is stated that these are real men in black coming again to interview you know, a witness to a, an identified flying object experience. And this is a good clear picture of what some of these dudes look like. And as you can see, they're all dressed alike pretty much. And there are many other pictures you can see, but not many, but there's a few other pictures that claim to be real life men in black. You can look into the internet as well, you compare with them. But they have their customary uniform. They have their appearance, as you can see, expressionless. Uh, their eyes, in this case, they have regular looking human, humanoid eyes, but the same blank expression appear to be bald, you know, also a uh, humorless. They come in, they speak, they report that they're from the FBI, from the government, and they talk about the experience, as I've just told you about, and then they ask firmly, you know, not to speak about the experience. And then we have another more modern day experience here. I do believe this was in Europe also. And this was, again, videotaped where this mysterious man in black came in, and you can read up on it. We, I have the links you know, there. So the top one corresponds to the black and white picture. Uh, the bottom one here is to the color, you know, photograph here. This is more of uh, modern times. And this man in black came and was speaking to his secretary at this office, ground floor, because he walked right in from the street. And then it seems there's a bit of a video or there are other pictures, there's a story attached where somehow they were there, he was speaking to her and the next thing she seemed to be gone from the desk as he's leaving. And then there's this mysterious photograph. If you see her just a little bit ahead of him, she, she seems to be leaving uh, in front of, along with him. So, but it's a very unusual photograph. She almost like disappears in the picture, very odd. So it's a very odd, you know, a story, a very odd picture. But these apparently are alleged, you know, real 
Life Men in Black. So you see that there. And I will be posting this later on, you know, on my Facebook page, uh, D'Angelis Colon, Trans Psychic Express. I'm filming this in Zoom right now, so I can present this, you know, on Facebook properly for all of you. So you can, you know, this will be there. You can uh, write down or whatever, you know, these websites that I've presented here, and you can look up this phenomenon yourself and read up on the stories, see the videos that are attached to some of them and draw your own conclusions about the experience. So relating to my story, uh, I had told this story a while back as well in one of my uh, previous programs. So I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, it's not necessary. And the whole story was much too big and just, this is just a part of it. But I'll just focus on this particular area of that story. But to just give you a general idea how it began, uh, it was back in May 26 of 2004. And it was in the middle of the night. Uh, I and my mother were asleep, obviously, in our home. And it was a very stormy, rainy night. There was lightning, you know, lighting up the skies and thunder, which we don't have as much, you know, here in New York City anymore like we used to years ago. So it was a very unusual night as well. And in that night, you know, I woke up because of the thunder and the lightning. Oh my God, that's so impressive. And I was like, ooh, taken aback by it. But I fell asleep you know, through there. And as I did, I started having this incredible dream or so it seemed like a dream. As I look back now and as I know now, it wasn't really so much as a dream, it was an actual um, interdimensional experience because it lasted for a lot of the evening. And there's a lot to the story there. Uh, but one portion that fits with this was towards the beginning of the experience where we've got a knock on the front door in the dream, and I'll call it a dream, the you know, experience in the middle of the night and where, you know, all of a sudden my mother woke up from her room. I woke up as well. We heard this knocking and it was like, you know, we went to the door. I followed my mother because she was going to see what's going on at two o'clock in the morning or so. And... As we were approaching you know, our front door in our home, all of a sudden these, I noticed these people were in our house and they were like right next to us. There must've been like two or three of them. And they looked very much like officials, like authorities, like government officials, obviously. And I remember one in particular was wearing a white shirt, the black tie, the black pants. He did not have a black jacket on, nor did he have the hat on, but he did have the rest of that attire that is very familiar with the men in the black. And they were there. We didn't really speak very much, but I knew that they were there. I said, how did these people get in here? So it was a bit of a frightening experience for a moment for my mother and I, and we were like, who are you? And it was very a lot more like mental telepathy more than anything else. But somehow in this experience, I recognized that these people seem to be something that are here from the authorities for some reason. I recognize it in some level that this may have related to some secret organization that had to do with the supernatural paranormal. And the guy was there giving an intimidating presence. In fact, they were giving an intimidating presence to us, trying to like put a stop to this, to whatever was going to transpire and causing fear. Without saying a word, but at the same time, there was communication in some way that if we did something, something bad would happen to us. So I, recognizing this, I said, no, no. I have an idea who you are. I know who you are. You're not gonna stop this experience, not knowing what the experience really was, but you're not gonna intimidate us. I know who you are. You're not gonna do anything to us. We're gonna persist with this and we're gonna continue. And there's someone knocking on the door and you're not gonna be able to stop us. And sure enough, as I became stronger, less fearful, they kind of backed off. They were almost like in a bit of a, lack of a better way of saying of a quandary about what to do. I mean, they could have done something, but they didn't, which was interesting. And it's like my mother also lost it. I helped my mother lose her fear and continue going to the front door. 
and they were there and we went to the front door. Now in our home, our front door has our kitchen entrance right directly at the front of the vestibule right there. And we have our kitchen. So I remember that as my mother went to the door, I went to the door, these people were there. There was more of them, by the way, at this point, there were like four or five or perhaps more. There were some in the kitchen this time, including the one that I initially encountered, who was a young person, I would say like in his early thirties or so, a male, light skinned, uh, blonde, had a crew cut, I remember. So he had a very shaved hair, blondish as well. He looked pretty regular, but he looked like an official and he looked like he would be an FBI person. He had that demeanor and that look as the rest of the other ones did and they looked similar, you know, also. And there was more, and I remember there was a woman also who was part of their team. So it was a team of people that were there and they seemed to be set in place, you know, in our apartment for some reason. And in our kitchen, we have a small table, a breakfast table with two chairs. I remember distinctly stepping into the kitchen. He was there. He was still trying to cause some sort of intimidation. So there was another one. And there was a few others in our apartment, as I realized behind us also, they had remained. And they looked similar, you know, also. But I remember these two, him and a woman who was part of their team. And she was sitting at the breakfast table. And she had some sort of like computer on the table and she was doing some work as she was monitoring things and looking at things and corresponding in some way with this, I would say almost like laptop computer system on our table. So they commandeered basically our kitchen to use it as a base of operations. And there was more you know, in there. And there was another guy there who was also doing some of the sort of work or whatever in some way also, and there was equipment also too. So they had taken over our kitchen in a way, use it as a base of operations. And it was just interesting to witness this and to see this throughout this experience. So again, I was not intimidated. I said, you're not going to put a stop to this. This is more very telepathic, by the way. And there's no fear. This is our home. We're going to do as we want. You cannot stop us with what you have no jurisdiction you know, to do that. And they seem to be put off by that and seem somehow because of my lack of fear and standing up for myself and for my home and for my family, for my mother as well, they seem to be powerless against that and couldn't do anything. But it seemed that they were in communication with something else and they seemed to get the, I just had the sense they got the approval to let the experience go ahead. There's nothing they could do to stop it. And basically said, well, they, you cannot do anything up to these people. They are going to proceed. So they're going to proceed. So there's nothing you can do. So we overcame that, whether they were granted permission to let us move forward, or we were granted permission in some way to move forward with this. It just had that sense and that feeling in the experience. So it moved in that direction. From there, you know, I woke up back in my room for a bit of time. I was processing what I had just experienced in the so-called dream state, but what occurred? I said, my goodness, what's going on here? The storm was still out there. It was still raining heavily, severely. Um, there was still some thunder as we could hear it, at least I could hear it especially. This was in the middle of the night. This is like three in the morning or so at this point. Um, but I remember like waking up, thinking about what just transpired. I said, my God, what is going on here? And then I said, this is fascinating. What an incredible experience. So what I did do was I drifted back into sleep again. And when I did, once again, we, I heard a knocking on the door in the interdimensional state. And again, I woke up from my bed. I remember distinctly what I was wearing also. And I will tell you what I was wearing in the dimensional state was exactly what I was wearing in the, let's say, um, real life here, for lack of a better way of saying it, you know, state, you know, also as was my mother. She had her nightgown on in reality or this reality here. And she had the same thing on in the interdimensional state also. And once again, my mother, got up again and we went, we knew it was something's going on here, whatever. We went 
We walked down the hall. I followed her once again, closely behind the door. Somebody was knocking on the door. And this time there was nothing there to stop us. We had apparently, were able to overcome the experience of these authorities, these people in black, these men in black. They could no longer put a stop to the experience or to us. And we were able to open the door, you know, from there and have this amazing experience there with interesting beings from other dimensions, from other places that came by, that were standing there in the front door and came in and floated in as well. And there's a lot more to the story, you know, there. Um, I will, let's say, um, post something that I have. I wrote this story out a long time ago and I had it on my Facebook page. Ever since uh, Facebook went to beta, I do believe they erased the section of notes that used to be part of my public page. So I can no longer find that. That's not cool. I was not happy with that because I had some materials in there. Luckily, I have a lot of that information and material that I posted on the notes section, you know, saved. So I'm gonna find another way of presenting that on the beta page now of, you know, of the Angelus Cologne Transpsychic Express, you know, public page. So I'll post the whole story so that you can see in its entirety and know what I'm talking about. You, for those of you who did not read it, you'll find it most fascinating. Whether you believe it or not, that is up to you, but it is my experience. And I have some cooperation that something did occur that evening. Uh, what I will tell a little bit about that actually was that on May 26 of 2004 was exactly the two month anniversary of my father's passing. He had passed in March 26 of 2004. So the timing was very, very interesting there. Plus with the storm and all the electromagnetic activity that was occurring that particular evening, which is completely unusual on that particular evening, adds to the entire experience you know, as well. So looking back on that, when I awoke, well, there's more to it as well. We also had some real life witnesses, by the way, uh, that same night also to, let's say, add more to this incredible story. Because after you know the, the experience happened, I'll, I won't leave you hanging in the air to that extent. After our experience happened with the interesting extraterrestrial beings or so, um, it was a wonderful experience at the end, by the way. Uh, I woke up, you know, again. I said, gee, what's, what was that? That was incredible. But then, around five in the morning or close to five in the morning or so, our front door, there was a knocking, but this time it was not in the interdimensional state. This time it was here on our, in our very own reality here in the living state. So we were wide awake. So for the third time, even though this time it was here and the now in the present, the awake state, you know, we got a knock on the door. This was close to five in the morning or so because it was still night outside. And my mother woke up. I woke up. This time we were like shaken. I said, what's going on? Because things like this never happened to us. Things like that never happened here. Rarely, you know, here where we live. And my mother and I, you know, went to the door because there was real knocking. And again, I was right behind my mother as we're going. And we heard someone say on the other, from the other side of the door, police, it's the police. And my mother, you know, opened the door with the chain first. And there were two or three policemen, plus two of our neighbors, two of our upstairs neighbors from our, top, from our upper floor were accompanying them. So when we saw both of them, we know both of them very, very well. We knew them for years. Uh, we opened the door. And then there they all were, all five of them. They were there. So just standing there right in front of our door, like in a semicircle. I said, are you all right? Are you all right? Uh, there was reported screaming coming from your apartment. And my mother and I looked at each other and said, no, there's no such, we're fine, we're asleep. And at that point, I wasn't equating anything with, the experience we, I just had just occurred, you know, several hours, you know, in the night. I said, "No, we're fine. We've been we've been asleep." And my mother was just she didn't remember a thing. And even though she was part of 
the experience, but she was fine. She was just startled because of the police coming at five in the morning, practically, to knock on our door and our neighbors there. And they said, well, it's reported that they were screaming coming from this apartment and from this floor. Are you guys all right? That we're perfectly fine. We were, we were asleep. And we were. We were fine. That they could see that we were fine. We were calm. And everything, no, nothing unusual. I said, okay, because your neighbors were worried because they heard it. They called. And both of our neighbors were standing next to them. And both of our neighbors were very credible people, very serious people, not prone to hysteria or drama, or certainly not mentally you know, off or mentally disturbed, both very respectable individuals that we've known for years. And they were, they were worried and that we heard noise and stuff and that, no, no, we're perfectly fine. Thank you so much, however, for coming and for, for calling, for checking in. We're perfectly fine. So the police were okay with it. And both gentlemen were fine. And that was it. And that was the end that we went, we went back to our rooms, you know, and we talked a little bit about, oh my God, what could have, what a strange thing. And the storm and whatever also. But my mother went back to her room and I went back to mine and we kind of drifted off, you know, after we overcame the excitement a bit. And that was it until the next, you know, until we woke up later on in the morning, you know, during sunlight hours or so. And then we were talking about the experience that occurred. Oh my God, how incredible. How that, what could have happened? We have to talk later on to Michael and to uh, Mr. DeMeo, our other neighbor, to see, you know, what happened. She was going to discuss it with them or get in touch with them later to see why, what they heard and why they called the police. But that was later on in the day. So that's part of that experience. The rest you'll have to read about and I post it you know, on my Facebook page and it'll start, start to make more sense to you. So for me, that was my experience about this relating to the men in black phenomenon about people that can come through to your home in other strange ways and whether they come you know in the real the real world here or through some sort of interdimensional you know, state like with mr bender for instance they just came through the wall and they were just floating there for him and they materialized suddenly out of nowhere and it happens in different ways in different forms and it's something that's there. So for me, when I had this experience, it certainly lent more to me about the truth and the reality of these types of beings being real and that they can present themselves, they can do this and they have incredible paranormal abilities, whether it's UFO or not. And yes, before I finish with this story, there is something that perhaps relates with UFO, you know, with my experience, you know, as well. So that all comes together also. Again, you got to read the story. I'll be posting it, you know, soon. So with that, the men in black phenomenon is something that needs more exploration. They're revealing more and more about this. More is coming out about the subject and more will be revealed as more is being talked about, more programs are being presented about the UFO phenomenon and experience. We're getting the government to open up more. We're getting people from the government now doing shows of their own about this experience and their research and their investigations and what they're trying to find out. And that more and more people are starting to come to government to try to petition or to even pressure them to reveal the truth, reveal what is happening about all of this. And a lot of people in government are very intrigued and interested by the way on this. And there have been a few meetings or so relating to this. And there was one committee several years ago, actually that came together with some of the world's most renowned UFOologists and researchers that went to Capitol Hill to, to petition you know, for this and for disclosure as it's called. And some of those people that were there were very interested and very intrigued. And there've been some of our politicians there, including a Senator or two or so, a Congressman or so that have had experiences and do believe in this. And I've also have been working on seeing if they can finally get the lid off to uncover you know this and pressure somehow push somehow to finally getting this all revealed very very difficult this is something that's been there for years secretive for years so even the president or so isn't fully informed as far as we know anyway 
some presidents more than other have more experience, you know, in regards to this and are privy more to this type of information. Just how much so, we're not sure. Some of it, however, is indicated it could be quite frightening, however, quite intimidating. And therefore, it's they've kept shut and kept quiet. So they appear, it seems that they appear to know more than the, what they can reveal. It could be for the good of us all. It could be for some other reason that we don't know about. It could be because, again, just to avoid you know, a change in the world, it could be something that could be cataclysmic to the world. Not necessarily a disaster or a catastrophe, but something or information or truth that could change world history. And the majority of people in the world are not ready for that, that perhaps we may not be exactly what we think we are, or that the world and people are not exactly what we've been led to believe or the stories that have been left behind from generation after generation, that there could be something else, something more, something frightening, or you just don't have the capability to comprehend what all of this could mean yet. We may still have to learn to evolve a bit more even though I do believe we're getting closer and we're getting at a state where we are being able to have our minds be more open, more advanced, where we can finally understand what that would mean. So stay tuned. Things are moving rapidly and it looks like it's going to happen a lot sooner than lots of people think. And for sure, it should be happening and I, fact, I know it will be happening before the end of the 21st century. So on that note, I'll leave you with that exciting bit of intriguing you know, information. And I wish you all a good evening. Thank you for joining me here. If you want to find out more about this subject and about me as well, you can go into my Facebook public page, De Angelis Colon Trans Psychic Express for more information. So. Take care, good night, have a wonderful weekend, and I'll see many of you hopefully next week on my next program. Take care, bye-bye.